Well, let me welcome you to week two in the Exodus experience. Glad that you're here. Again, a little bit of a different setup this morning, so um, flow with us here. The thing that's happening is this room is being used multiple times during the week for different things, so we don't always get a chance to be able to reset it back to how it normally is, but uh, for those of you here, welcome. For those of you online, we're glad you're here with us as well. Um, as we begin week two, we're going to look at two more verses in Exodus chapter 14. Um, I promise you we will get beyond just handling two verses, but not today. We're going to be in Exodus 14 verses 3 and 4, but let me do a quick review what we learned last week in this first session of the Exodus experience is that God has brought us to the right place at the right time, wherever you are. And he's brought us to the right place at the right time for him to show up and for him to be able to remind us that he's the one at work, he's the one that knows the way, he's the one that knows you. And he's brought us to this Exodus experience, actually to this rock and a hard place, so that we have only one thing we can do, and that is be dependent upon him. Bottom line, that's where we are in the Exodus experience to start. So in looking at this second section, we're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4. But I want to start with a, um, a story. Um, you all live in Houston or have lived close to Houston, so you know that there's something called hurricane season. A lot of the country doesn't understand hurricane season. A lot of the world doesn't understand hurricane season. But we in specific understand hurricane season. When my family first moved to Houston in 1961, we happened to move the week of Hurricane Carla that basically leveled the city of Galveston. We moved here from Dallas. Prior to that, we'd lived in Michigan, and the question was, what's a hurricane? We had no idea. When I graduated college and got out on my own, I was living in a little townhome in Houston, and um, was watching the news one day and saw a hurricane coming into the Gulf. Not that big of a worry, again, in Houston, living in Houston proper, which you learned was typically what happened was a hurricane would hit, if it hit Galveston, it would kind of spread it out and diminish it, and we might get some wind and some rain, but that was about it. As we tracked this hurricane, we found that wasn't the case with this one. It hit, came straight up I-45, it was coming straight over my house. <laughs> we all know, because we've lived through those, that the front end of the hurricane is not as difficult as the back end of the hurricane. Back end of the hurricane is where all the power is. So I hunkered down thinking, okay, this hurricane's going to pass over, but I'm in a townhome. I'm surrounded by other homes. This, I'm not sitting out in the middle of no place. The front end of the hurricane came, and I'm watching the trees begin to bend. I'm watching the rain come in horizontally. And then the most amazing thing happened. The eye of the storm passed directly over my house. And I did probably the stupidest thing you can do. I went outside. I opened the door and looked up, and the sky was dark, and the clouds were everywhere, but it was dead still, dead calm. The wind had stopped. The rain had stopped. It's the strangest thing to be standing in the eye of a storm, have the eye come over you, and you actually seeing all the debris, all the damage around you, and yet there's not a single sound. The trees aren't moving. The rain isn't coming. Mean, it, it, was it was an eerie experience, but to be standing in the middle of this peace when that kind of storm was circling. And then all of a sudden you could hear the wind begin to come, ran back inside, and the back end of the storm came. Thankfully, it was only about two hours of that back end of the storm, and then the storm moved on beyond Houston. But the one thing that, that amazed me in that was to see the majesty of the storm around me, the majesty of God's power around me, and yet to be in the middle of the storm with peace and calm. That visual has remained with me for years and years and years to understand God telling me in the midst of the storm, you can have 
an unbelievable peace. Why? Because he's in it with you. We're going to look at this next section. And this next section I call Glory Hallelujah. <laughs> but not maybe for the reason that you think I am. Let me read it, verses 3 and 4. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness is just an end. Uh, hang on just a minute. Hang on just a minute. I did. Okay, we got it. Start again, verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they're bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. This is a really fascinating thing because God had a plan when he brought Israel to this place, which we know from the first verse, uh, the, the camp before Pi-Hiroth between Migdal and the sea opposite baal Sephon. If any of you know exactly where that is, here's what they did. They came past the place they were going to camp, made a U-turn, and went back to camp. And you might think, now why would they do that? For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they're bewildered by the land. He will say of the children of Israel because they've turned around, they're lost. They don't know where they're going. This is the perfect time for me to take my army down and go attack, which is exactly what God is wanting to happen. See, God doesn't live in space and time. He lives outside of space and time. He knows what's coming. He knows what's going to happen. What he has planned is this opening for the nation to look like it is bewildered. They've turned around. They're, they're, it's like they're going in circles in this, in this wilderness place. They've set up camp, but they've been going in circles. So what's going on? This is to have Pharaoh look at them and say, they're bewildered. And they've chosen to camp with the Red Sea in front of them which is impassable, too deep for them. The wilderness on one side, the mountains on the other side, they can't get away either way, and I'm going to be bearing down behind them. God has set this up so that Pharaoh thinks, I've got them. I now have them. This feeling that they're, they've literally lost their way, in fact, the wilderness has closed them in, it, it, it likens itself to this. Have you ever felt like you've been in an Exodus experience and you feel claustrophobic? Like you can't breathe. Like the stress is so great you can't get out of this and you don't know the way out. This is exactly what God presents to Pharaoh that this is the way the nation of Israel is acting. Like they are claustrophobic. They're pinned in. They don't know what they're doing. They've lost their way. And our natural instinct at this time my natural instinct at this time is to ask questions. The first question that I ask is, how did I get here? How did I get into this mess, and how do I get out of this mess? In fact, my, my actual instinct is this. How can I get out of this as quickly as I possibly can? How can I fix this? I'm a guy. Guys love to fix things. Don, am I correct? Yes. Thank you. We love to fix things. And we're in an Exodus experience that guess what? We can't fix. God has brought us to a place where we can't fix it. Who do we turn to? God help me out of this mess. God doesn't always answer that question immediately. Many times as we saw him strong at the broken places, he leaves us in that place so that we learn the lesson that he desires to teach us. We learn the character trait he's desiring to build in us. We have to learn first <clears throat> that God's going to do it his way. The overarching point of this is God's not looking at us and saying it's about you. 
Our Exodus experience, whether we want to believe it or not, is not about us. It's about him entering into our lives and us allowing him to do what he does best. Loving on us, coming alongside of us, molding us and shaping us, loving us through our Exodus experience. Mark, do you ever give him suggestions? <laughs> do I ever give him suggestions? I give him suggestions all the time. The question is, are my suggestions commands? God, you need to do this this way. You need to fix it this way. You need to make it happen this way. Yes, I do that all the time. And I'm grateful that God doesn't listen to me. Maybe. The the point many times is, in the midst of an Exodus experience, we don't always know exactly what's going on, but God does. And so allowing God to do it His way is the way that we actually bring Him into that situation rather than holding Him at bay and saying, I'm going to get it fixed, I'll fix it myself. And that quick fix is not always the best thing. There was a New Yorker who was driving through Texas. <laughs> and he collided, rear-ended into the back of a pickup truck that was hauling a horse trailer that had a horse in it. Not an uncommon sight in Texas. When he collided with the back of this thing, there was a tremendous accident. The driver was thrown clear. The driver of the truck was thrown clear. The horse was thrown clear. And as he's on the road, he's lying there, kind of looking over the damage that had been done. A few months later, he tried to collect damages. And the lawyer came to him and said, why now are you trying to collect damages? In fact, at the scene, you said you were fine. This New Yorker said, well, you see, it's like this. It's my best New York accent. Yeah. <laughs> you see, it's like this. I was lying there in the road, and I was in pain. I was in a lot of pain. And while I'm lying there in the road, I heard somebody say the horse had a broken leg. And this Texas Ranger came over, took out his pistol, shot the horse, and then looked at me and said, are you okay? <laughs> what do you think I was going to say? <laughs> So sometimes we look to fix things the quickest way we can, and it's not always the best. In fact, most times, not allowing God to do it his way is not always the best. So will I allow God to bring me through an Exodus experience his way, or is my mindset set in such a fashion that I'm looking for him? Am I looking for him first rather than how do I get it fixed? Brother Lawrence said it this way. He said, the sorest afflictions never appear intolerable except when we see them in the wrong light. If we see them without God in the midst of them, they are intolerable. If we see them with the God of the universe in them, set to do it his way, they're not intolerable. It's been said in the past, in adversity, we usually want God to do the removing job when what he wants to do is an improving job. In the midst of our experiences, we want God to remove it. What God wants to do is improve us. And I love the way it's put, to realize the worth of the anchor, we need to feel the storm. If you want to know the anchor that God is, feel him in the midst of the storm. Feel him in the eye of the storm when you feel his peace all around you. Is my problem an occasion for God to work his wonders by his way, in his time, for his glory? I've asked Melissa to come share with you just for a moment. This is a little bit of a, a removal from what we normally do, but she's got a testimony I think you need to hear. Well, about 12 years ago, I suffered my eighth concussion. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if you all know, but concussions are somewhat cumulative so that as you have more, you're more easily concussed the next time with more uh, possible fallout from it. And this one was a game changer. Um, we thought that I would get better with time as I had all the other times, but this time, for whatever reason, I didn't seem to improve. So we finally, after about six months, went and had a full battery of tests done and came to realize that I had permanent brain damage from this last concussion um, and that I was on a course of um, dementia. This At this point, was very early in the game and I still had great memory intact, but I was really struggling with um, executive function, being able to function just day-to-day -day things, as well as a great deal of balance issues from the damage that it did to the portion of my brain with my eyes. Um, over the course of these last 11 years, I've had at least two more concussions because part of what happened was I lost awareness of where the top of my head is. So I have clunked uh, a few more times since then and done enough damage that I'm well on the path now. Um, we have prayed fervently for the Lord to heal. We have asked all the time for him to come alongside and give me enough cognitive function that I won't have to go down this path. And at this point, the answer each day thus far has been, I love you, glorify me yeah. as you are. And, um, you know, needless to say, that has taken some wrangling. I feel a little bit like Jacob, not a hip out of joint, more like a brain out of joint. <laughs> but um, he has been very clear to me thus far that his grace is sufficient mm -hmm. for me. So I walk each day um, asking. I never cease to ask, Lord, if it be according to your will and your plan, if it brings you more glory to heal my brain and allow me to function in the fullness of how you created me, please bring it on. And thus far, um, the answer has been no. And I'm at peace with that because what he has shown me in this is that his glory and my good are one and the same. I don't ever have to wrangle with, is this better this way or this way? Because what he allows for me, I know is for his glory. And if it's for his glory, how could it be not the best for me as well? So we continue to walk through. It's always a, a new day as you progress down this path. Um, this fall, the progression as we got evaluated again, um, has definitely taken a, a pretty big step. So I no longer drive, but you all watch out because you may see me out here in the woodlands. I don't drive a car. I now drive a scooter. So <laughs> I can still get around a little bit. And that way, if I, if I have a little moment with my brain, it's me that's hurt and nobody else. I can't hurt anybody on my scooter. So anyway, I just want to encourage you all by saying that truly his plans are beautiful and if it is meant for his glory then whatever it is is for my best as well and um so it's an interesting path but it is a path that it's amazing to be able to say i wouldn't trade it i really would not trade it so watch out i figure when you're 66 you're blonde you're menopausal and you're brain injured that's a combo <laughs> <laughs> I asked her to share um, because many times you listen to a speaker and you sometimes think you don't have things going on. You don't understand my situation. We have lived with an Exodus experience and are continuing to live with an Exodus, Exodus experience, knowing that if God doesn't heal, we know the path we're on. And that's a really fascinating place to be because every day is the type of day where you look at it and say, God, if you choose to heal, I'm here. If you choose not to heal, I understand what it's about. It's about your glory and my good. So personal experience, we're walking through what I'm teaching. We know where we speak. 
Moving on. This is what's happening to the nation of Israel. And so Pharaoh, thinking that he's got them where they want, here's what God says. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now I need to talk about this word hardening of the heart. Because there's a lot of people that believe, well, that's not fair, God. You didn't give him a chance to have an out. You hardened his heart so that he couldn't really make a determination. I want to give you three reasons why this hardening of the heart is God giving Pharaoh every opportunity. And then we're going to turn it, unfortunately, to a convicting statement about our own hardened hearts. The first thing I want to tell you is, in this hardening of the heart, the character of Pharaoh and what we see in the Exodus, in the book of Exodus, is this. Pharaoh hardened his heart well before God ever entered into the picture. Six times in the plagues, before the seventh plague in which God then said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, six times before, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. He hardened his heart against the nation. He hardened his heart against the nation. He hardened his heart six times before God basically said, now I will harden his heart. So the pattern had already been set in place. The first reference we ever see to God hardening Pharaoh's heart happens back in chapter 4, where it's actually predictive of the fact that this is going to happen. Is God omniscient? Yes. He knew Pharaoh would harden his heart. So God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, but it's predictive of what happens after Pharaoh had already hardened his heart. So six plagues go. He's hardened, he's hardened, he's hardened, he's hardened, he's hardened, he's hardened. And then God enters in and said, I will harden his heart, which is basically continuing the pattern that Pharaoh had already set. Second, the Hebrew word for hardening can also be translated twisted. Now, let me just ask you a question. If you take a sponge and you fill it with dirty water and you twist it, what comes out? Dirty water. Dirty water, whatever's in it. Because this can also be translated twisted, think about what God was doing with Pharaoh, putting him in a situation where he actually began to twist him so that his natural character began to come out. What was already in Pharaoh was coming out. Pharaoh wanted to annihilate the Jews. He wanted to keep them subservient. He wanted to be slaves. He wasn't looking at them as the, the children of God. He was looking at them as something under his foot. And if they died, they died. All God did was put a little pressure on that so that that character that was already in Pharaoh began to come out. Now, there's a third thing that most people don't understand, and that is in the Egyptian culture. And I'm going to read this just to make sure I get it correct. In the Egyptian culture, it was believed that when a person died, his heart was weighed in what's called the Hall of Judgment. So your heart came up, and it was at, you were put on trial, and your heart was weighed in the Hall of, of Judgment. And if one's heart was heavy with sin, what they would actually do is they would place a stone beetle, a scarab, with some weight onto the heart. The reason they did that, and this was called hardening of the heart, the reason they did that was so that the person would stay silent and not confess their sin so they would never be judged. It was called hardening of the heart because what they wanted to do was if your sin was never confessed because your heart was being hardened, you could never be judged and therefore you were saved because it would look as if you'd never sinned. What does God do? God takes Pharaoh hardens his heart, puts the pressure on him to the point that Pharaoh confesses three times his sin. And on the basis of his confession of his sin for wanting to destroy the nation of Israel, God judges him. So actually, this hardening of the heart, what God is doing is he's placing Pharaoh in a position that, first of all, by the hardening of his own heart, by the twisting of his heart to see his true character come out, and by his own confession... Pharaoh is being judged. Is God a gracious God? 
Could Pharaoh at any one of those times said, God, you are the Lord, you're it, and God would have probably... Think about the Ninevites. It's a nation that was totally against God. In fact, they were actually holding up God as somebody to be jeered and mocked at. And yet God sent Jonah to say, if you deliver this message, I'll save the whole nation. You think God wanted to destroy? No. But because of the hardening of his heart, because of his own confession, because of the twisting, because of his hardened heart, Pharaoh judges himself, which then judges his nation. And the nation followed Pharaoh. So when we think about the fact that this might be an unfair situation for God, God gives him three different opportunities, in fact, many more than that, to turn it around. And Pharaoh simply doesn't do it. That picture of the twisting of the heart, that picture of the hardening on multiple occasions, this hardening of the heart in the culture that resulted in a silence, an absence of that confession, it's amazing to see what God does. God actually, by the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, moves him to the point of the confession of his sin, not his confession of sin to the point of saying, forgive me, but just confession of the sin that's saying, this is what I want to do. And God says, based on that, that's what your judgment comes. John Hanna, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, said this, in God's infinite wisdom, he raised up this Pharaoh for that occasion so that his rebellion against God might be an instrument for God's glory. Now think about that. Can God use anything, anywhere, anytime for his glory? And here's the beautiful part about it. When he gets the glory, we get the good. This is why you can say this. God's not an egomaniac. He's not sitting there, glorify me, glorify me, glorify me. He's not saying that. What he does say is glorify me so that I can bless you. We get the blessing. We get the good. That's an amazing God. By the way, Moses also told Pharaoh this was coming. Back in Exodus 4, he said, You shall say to Pharaoh, God said this, You shall say to Pharaoh, Moses, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, I will indeed kill your son, your firstborn. God gave him all the chances in the world. We're in Exodus 14. The Exodus has occurred. Back in Exodus 4, God said, This is coming. So when Passover occurs and Pharaoh's firstborn is taken, who has God protected? His firstborn, the nation of Israel. What he's basically saying to Pharaoh is, you think you're going to take my firstborn. It's not the way it's going to happen. And I gave you all the advance warning you needed to know that I will take your firstborn. We have, a, we have such, a, um, such a different mindset, but the culture back then, this was not a peaceful culture. This was an incredibly violent culture. And the way you solved issues in a violent culture was with violence. So this is the trade-off that God makes. The trade-off is, I'm going to give you all the warning in the world. I'm going to even pull it out of you and give you the opportunity. But I'm going to tell you, if you strike my firstborn, I will strike yours first. God protecting his nation. God being sovereign. Hosea 11.1 1 says very specifically, the nation of Israel is God's firstborn, and they are sacred to him. So what was Pharaoh doing? <laughs> Pharaoh was trotting on sacred ground. Will I wait on God to bring me through an Exodus experience in his time? Or will my heart be hardened toward him? And that's a really great question. The reason I placed that question in front is because I've heard countless times in ministry over and over and over again about people who have said, because of the situation I'm in, I've now hardened my heart towards God. I'm angry toward him. He's done this to me. 
In fact, you can go all the way back to the book of Ruth and listen to Naomi say, God did this to me. And yet the interesting thing is the book of Ruth, we're watching God help her at every single step. It's an amazing thing to hear her say, I went out full on my own. But God, you brought me back empty. And yet who's standing right beside her? Ruth, the one that God has put in her life to help bring her and put her into, by the way, the national line of the, of the King David, the national line of Christ. God has blessed her over and over and over again, because, but because of her hardened heart towards God, she couldn't see it. I pray for us that we will, in an Exodus experience, let God do it his way in his time and not harden our hearts toward him so we don't see him at work in our lives. It's such a critical part of getting through this. But there's a third premise here, and that is he will do it for his glory. Now, I want to define glory for you because it's really important that we get this idea of what glory is. The definition of glory is this, the visible manifestation of the character of God. When God's glory is on display, what is it that's on display? His character. It's his character that's on display. So when you see beautiful mountains, what part of God's character is on display? His creativity, his beauty, his color matching expertise, his interior design capabilities. <laughs> There's a lot of his character that goes into his creation. When we love on one another, we're extending the love of God to one another. What character of God is on display? It's God's love that's on display. Because let's face it, on our own, we're not very lovable creatures. But because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and God is in us, it's his character that's on display. This is why you see in, uh, you see in 2 Corinthians 3, he says that God is changing us from glory to glory, one glory at a time. He's changing us from character trait to character trait, one character trait at a time by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. That's what he's doing in us. So when we put God on display, when we glorify God, what we're really saying is we're putting God's character on display. We are the manifestation of the body of Christ, the manifestation of the full character of God to the world. So when you think about this glory, to glorify God means to put God on display in our lives. A guy by the name of John Piper wrote a little book called Let the Nations Be Glad. And in this, he put a progression together, and I want to walk you through this progression because it lays out God's glory. And I think it's a really marvelous way of thinking about the progression of God's glory. First, he says this, the glory God seeks to magnify is supremely the glory of his mercy. The primary, now, now think about this for a minute. God is love, yes. God is holy, yes. But the thing he supremely puts out there to glorify himself, the character trait that he wants known most of all is his mercy. Now, what is mercy? Withholding from us what we deserve. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. And does his grace abound? All over the place. But his mercy is him withholding from us what we deserve. What does my sin beget me? The wrath of God. What does he withhold from us? His wrath. Where, where did he place his wrath? On his only son. The merciful act of his son being our, basically our mercy seat. The place where God laid my sin is the supreme act of a God who is merciful. I'm going to take your sin, which you have committed, and I'm going to place it on my son and let him be the one that pays that penalty for you. So we start with the glory God seeks to magnify is supremely the glory of his mercy. You see it all over the place. Second, Christ became a servant and Christ brought mercy. Could Christ have come and judged the world? Did he have that right? 
Absolutely. He could have come and judged the world. Did he? No. He came to take the sin of the world upon himself. My sin, past, present, future. That's mercy. Christ came that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. He came for the world. The world might glorify God for the mercy that God has shown through Christ. God gets the glory and humans get the joy. So the more passionate God is for his glory, the more passionate he is for meeting our need as sinners. The more passionate he is about giving him the glory, the more passionate he is about the blessing that pours forth from him to us. Is this a merciful God? Is this a gracious God? Is this a loving God? The greatness of God has the paradoxical effect that he does not need people to work for him, but rather magnifies himself by working for them. And just take that one in for a moment. God working for us. If they will just wait for him. The nation of Israel waiting for God in his way, in his time, for his glory. Waiting specifically for him to do what he would do so that he gets the glory. Because when he gets the glory, who gets the good? Finally, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. He loves to exalt himself by showing mercy to sinners. God's Glory is on display in you every single day because of the mercy and the grace that he has shown you. You are to glorify God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether I eat or whether I drink, no matter what I do, do it to the glory of God. Whatever I do, do it in such a fashion that I glorify God. What do we say by glorify God? That I show him off to the world. Why? Because when the world sees his character through us, they don't get it. They ask questions. They want to understand, why do you act this way? Why can you stand at peace in the middle of a storm? Because I know who it is that's working in me and through me. And I'm waiting on his way in his time for his glory, not mine. Because I know when his glory is on display, I get the benefit. When I put God's character on display, what does it do to me? It molds and shapes me into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Is this great? In the middle of your toughest experience, you get the chance to put God on display. And when you do, he blesses you and graces you abundantly. We, um, we don't do this often. In fact, we rarely do this. But we're going to do this. Psalm 136. It's a little bit of a different day today. Psalm 136. There is a... Um, this was done for centuries in the church. This was a responsive reading for centuries in the church. And I want us to do this. So we're going to, this room is divided up beautifully for this. <laughs> this room, you're going to read the first part of the verse. This room, you're going to read the second part of the verse. Now, it's going to be a little bit different because the first part of the verse, we've got a number of different translations. <laughs> but this part, of the, this part of the room, you've got it easy. Here's your response. For his mercy endures forever. That's your response. Okay. I would have you practice it, but you're going to get enough practice here just to me. <laughs> this side of the room, we're going to start with this verse. It starts with, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Okay? So together, oh, give, oh, give thanks, thanks to, to the Lord, Lord for he, he is good. good. For his, his mercy endures, endures forever. forever. The next verse. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. 
for his mercy endures forever. Third verse. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his mercy endures forever. Next verse. To him who alone does great wonders. For his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn. For his mercy endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. I'll read the verse. <laughs> we're, we're getting lost there. I'll read the verse. And brought out Israel from among them. For his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. For his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. For his mercy endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. For his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. For his mercy endures forever. This has been a responsive reading for the nation of Israel for years and years and years and years and years. And years. I'm sorry, I pulled parts and pieces from that. Song. Yeah. So, so, I, I, the reason I pulled them is specifically those are the phrases that go to this particular passage. And I forgot that I had done that. My apologies to this side of the room. But here's what we get over and over again. Even the nation of Israel for thousands of years have recognized the mercy of God. And it's the mercy of God that endures forever. The mercy of God that endures upon us. The mercy of God that he has showered us with, withholding what we, what we deserve. His mercy endures forever. Listen to how he concludes this passage. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. I'm going to harden it to the point that he will come after the nation of Israel. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army. You see what his purpose is? You see what his point is? Who gets the glory here? God. And who is he trying to get the glory over? This isn't from the nation. This is for Pharaoh and his army. There's still an opportunity here for Pharaoh and his army to come to know the Lord. That the Egyptians may know that I am. That they may know that I am the Lord. Now, that phrase, I am the Lord, was used in the New Testament a number of times. First of all, in John 9. Jesus looking at a blind man when the question was asked, was this man blind from birth or this because of the result of his sin? Listen to what he responds. This man was born blind so that the power of God could be on display in his life. Mm. Maybe, just maybe, your Exodus experience is so that the power of God could be put on display for you and for those around you. Mm -hmm. In John 11, at Lazarus' tomb, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. See, God's not just interested in his own glory. He's interested in the glory of his Son. And by the way, Jesus said, I'm here to do what? Glorify my Father. A little bit of humility in that? A lot of humility in that. In John 12, Jesus said, for seeing his suffering coming, now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. There's the quick fix. God, take me out of this. I don't want to be here. But for this purpose, I came to this hour to glorify my Father's name. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask you this question. If that's Jesus' purpose, why is it not ours? Oh. Why is my purpose not today? How do I glorify my Father? How do I glorify Christ? How do I show him off? How do I put his character on display so he's the one people see, not me? And in the midst of an Exodus experience, guess what he's doing? He's putting us into that rock and a hard place so that we can put him on display if we wait on his way in his time for the purpose of his glory. Interesting that the last phrase of this passage, and they did so. <laughs> they did so. Notice what God didn't say to the nation. And by the way, um, I'll rescue Israel. 
Notice that's not in here. He says, these are the things that are going to happen, but he doesn't say, I'll rescue Israel from Pharaoh. What he is saying to the nation of Israel is, watch me work, wait on me in my way, in my time, for my glory, and it will ultimately be for your good. C.H. McIntosh said this, <laughs> if we could only look upon a difficult crisis as an occasion of bringing out on our behalf the sufficiency of divine grace, it would enable us to preserve the balance of our souls and to glorify God, even in the deepest waters. If we just had the right perspective. Missionary J. Hudson Taylor said, I know he tries me only to increase my faith. And that's all in love. Well, if he's glorified, I'm content. Listen to Psalm 106. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make mighty his power known. Robert J. Morgan of the Red Sea Rules said this, The Lord devised ways of turning difficulties into deliverance and problems into praise. He gives beauty for ashes and an attitude of worship for the spirit of heaviness. He will glorify his name in the lives of his children. He will glorify his name in the lives of his children. You know who he's talking about? Us. Us. He will glorify his name in you. Whatever their afflictions, he will gain honor for himself over our adversarial situations. In the process, he will leave behind such blessings as make the burdens melt away like wax in the sunshine. When we glorify him, our issues aren't nearly as big. The problems aren't nearly as great because we see the God of the universe in the midst of it with us. And if we will wait on him in his time, in his way, and work through it for his glory, we get the good. And we get the good from God. Oswald Chambers said it this way, God puts his saints where they will glorify him most. And we're no judges of where that should be. <laughs> will I ask God to bring me through an Exodus experience for his glory? Or do I see it only as being about me? God, why me? Why me? Why me? God's answer to that is because I want you to see me. He's put us in the right place at the right time for his glory and for our good. That's why we can say glory, hallelujah, because <laughs> it's all about him. Questions, thoughts, comments. Mark. Yes, ma'am. When uh, Bob was near the end of his life at Genesis 2, like we'd gotten to know the girls that worked there really well. So I knew all about them. And there were three in the kitchen, as well as me. Two of them were believers. I knew that. I'd witnessed to the other one. She was not. She had a atheist for parents. And anyway, they're all in tears and they can't understand why I'm at peace. Mm -hmm. That God's about to take Bob home. Yeah. So uh, I explained to them, I know where he's going. He's had a good life, and it's his time now. This isn't a surprise to God. So the two left. The one at the sink, I went and talked to him. She trusted Christ as her Savior that day. <laughs> and I thought, thank you, Lord. And I keep up with her. Yeah. So uh, we never know what he's doing or how he's going to use it, but just, you know, praise his name. Yeah. Well, and you know, that's the interesting thing. You just said it, Jane. We don't always know what he's doing. We don't always know what what strings he's pulling. Um, I have a good friend who used to say he owns the chessboard and he can move the chess pieces however he wants. Maybe he's moving a chess piece to put us right in the middle of something so that as we go through it, people look at us and say, how can you have such peace? How can you be standing out in the middle of a storm? Because I'm in the eye. I'm right where God wants me to be. He's the one that's got his covering over me. And in the midst of all this chaos, I can be at peace because I know who it is that's on my side. 
I know who it is that's working for me. And if I will be patient and wait for his time and his way and give him the glory, I get the benefit. Yes. No. It's a little confusing sometimes when you see a situation that people's actions create this situation they're in. And it's maybe doing nothing. And if they would do something <laughs> through God, they wouldn't be in the shape they're in. So hang, hang on to okay. that thought. All right. Now I want you to explain. We have eight more <laughs> eight more sessions. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a part of that that makes sense in these eight in these next eight sessions. But but you're right. Part of that next step can be waiting. Part of that next step can be as I'm waiting on God. What is He asking me to do now? It, maybe it's nothing more than prayer. Maybe it's nothing more than saying, "Please, God, show me You." Maybe it's simply that. That developing that patience of waiting in the midst of this for God to work. We don't know. And every situation is different. The whole point of this is before we rush in to say, I got to fix this. There's a perspective here that God is saying, I want you to turn to me. I want you to give me the glory. I'm not looking for you to come out of this and say, look at what I did. I fixed the problem. <laughs> I want you to look at me and say, God, you're the one. I'm going to give you the glory for this. Because you're the one that needs to be put on display in this. You're the one that people need to know about, not me. By the way, how many of you have actually saved somebody? Good. I'm glad no hands went up. We've shared Christ, but we don't have the power or the authority to save anybody. What we do have the power and the authority to do is to tell them about Jesus. To tell them about the one who is in the midst of it with us. I meant, I meant salvation, not actually saving somebody's life. Yeah. Well, I know yeah. <laughs> nurses in the room that have actually, you know, CPR and that kind of stuff. But even for, for that standpoint, what I'm talking about is we wait on God. We give him the glory. We put that into his camp because he's the one that... That deserves it. Yes. In that Psalm 106 that you referred to, there's that little verse in there. It's kind of like a quick fix. It's that verse 15, and it said, And he gave them their request, but sent the leanness unto their soul. Well, so don't forget, there, what we ask there, for. sometimes God gives us exactly what we ask for, but many times that he gives us exactly what we ask for, it's so that it puts us in a situation where we can do nothing but turn to him. We're going to see this in the nation of Israel. God, <clears throat> why did you save us? We were doing better in Egypt. <laughs> Excuse me? But the funny part about that is how many times have we said that? How many times have we said, God saved me from this, he does it. And we look at him later and go, I'm worse off here than I was there. Why did you do that? Well, you asked me, <laughs> and I did it. And ultimately, what I'm trying to do is to get you to look to me, not to you, because I did what you asked me to do, not what I wanted to do. Yes? You keep using that word, patience. That is the most difficult word that we have in our vocabulary most of the time. Yes. I agree. Patience is not. And, and so, so I'll ask you, when we talk about doing it in his time, one of the most difficult things for us to do, because God gave us intelligence and he gave us ability, is to wait on him. But a huge part of that is waiting on him to develop the patience in us to continue to wait on him. Um, we can get ourselves into a whole lot of mess. By trying to fix things that we're not capable of fixing. Mm -hmm. And if we have the patience to wait on him and allow him to fix. He's a much better fixer than I am. Mm -hmm. Just here to tell you. He can fix things really well. And he fixed things permanently. I don't. 
Any other thoughts, questions, comments? There was a fellow who came in to see Dr. Uh, Donald Barnhouse one time, and he said, I really need patience. Could you pray for me? And he said, yes. And they prayed together. And he said, Lord, you're sending problems. And, <laughs> and he said, no, wait, wait, wait. That's not what I said. I want you to pray for patience for me. He said, okay. You know, he prayed the same thing again. In other words, that's going to give us patience when we have problems. <laughs> Isn't that what James says? Uh-huh. Because consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, because those trials bring about patience. And patience brings about the completeness of us as believers, the maturing of us as believers. Wow, maybe that's why patience is so hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We don't normally have it. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll disagree with you here. We do have it. It was built into us. We just don't. We just don't want to use it. Yeah. Yeah. It is a. It is a fruit of the spirit, and it's in most of us. It's a fruit that's pretty shriveled because we don't want to use it. There's other, there's other fruit out there. I'd rather. I'd rather use. The world is constantly on the lookout for weakness in God. <laughs> Yes, and it is. When, and when we succumb, we partner with them in that. So when they tell us, oh, you see, this is this is what I've been telling you. This is a weakness of God. And you're thinking, well, yeah, it kind of is. And there is no weakness in God. So instead of partnering with them, we need to suck it up and stand up for it. <laughs> well, and that, that brings, you know, when Paul says, in my weakness, he is strong. It's it, when I'm standing on my own. Without God, I'm about as weak as they come. But when it's Christ through me, that's where the strength is. Yeah. Yeah. But in this case, Pharaoh saw this as a weakness of God. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. No question. Yeah. And I, 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 we're seeing, I love the way God's mind works in this. So here is Pharaoh who's watching them. And by turning them around and bringing them to this rock in a hard place, He's saying, here's what Pharaoh's going to do. Pharaoh's going to look at him and say, <laughs> I got him. And God's saying, that's exactly what I want Pharaoh to think. Because this is going to draw Pharaoh in. But I think it's to see over and over again, how many times did God graciously offer Pharaoh an opportunity to get out? An opportunity to follow after him? Think of how many times Moses says to Pharaoh, allow my people to come serve our God. That's, this was not, allow my people to come out under your oppression. Allow my people to come serve their God. That's all he's asking them to do. And I'm sorry, Pharaoh's a dummy. He was given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. So um, we will look next time. I kind of need to see where we're going next time. But we've got a few more verses next time. We'll be in 14... Five through nine. Wow, we're actually going to take in that many verses. So we'll be here about six hours. I pray for us and we'll close it out. Father, thank you for this opportunity and this time. I pray your constant reminder on us that we would be patient and wait for you to do things your way in your time for your glory, which then results in our good. We thank you that you are a God who loves us and desires to mold us and shape us into the image of your son that can be done no other way than walking through an Exodus experience. Help us to look to you in the midst of it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll see you next week.